So, uh, uh, yeah, welcome, Bjorn. Perhaps you can introduce yourself uh, briefly. Yes, my name is Bjorn Linde. I'm a, a research software engineer at uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So I uh, work with software and support on the HPC system in Norway. Okay, very interesting. So, so do you have uh, HPC systems uh, in Trondheim? Where you are. Yeah, we have uh, several systems. We have a local cluster, and uh, and then there is uh, two national systems installed in our basement here. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So uh, the topic that we have in front of us now is uh, software documentation, and uh, we will talk. Uh, and discuss with you all uh, about why software documentation is important and what different kind of documentation there are out there and, and why it's important to choose a good set of, of uh, various form of documentation for, for your project. Uh, one important thing here is that we will experiment with the, the documentation generator Sphinx. Which we, and this will do a little bit into the lesson. So, um, are you experienced with Sphinx, Johan? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, quite a bit. I, I'm, I'm using Sphinx uh, in, in uh, yeah, on, almost on a daily basis. As for are using Sphinx for um, for a lot of the documentation and the web pages that we have uh, for at the. Supercomputing Center here in Stockholm. So Sphinx is good for generating um, material for, for the web, which can be used, I mean, rendered locally on your computer, but also uh, hosted on, on uh, websites. Yeah, we will see that uh, during the lesson, how we can make uh, page, HTML pages locally and also do this to, uh, to a site or online. Yes, exactly. So we will first look here on motivation. So we have here some some uh, questions that we will put into the HackMD. Uh, and the questions are here. The main question is why documenting code? So we will take this and put it in the HackMD. And then we would like you to uh, contribute with with your input. So to highlight here um, the, the sub questions. So why is project documentation important? And how would you describe useful documentation? And how can you motivate your colleagues to contribute to the documentation? So I share over here to the HackMD. Sorry. While we're waiting, Bjorn, can you say something for audio test? Yes, checking audio. One, two, three, checking audio. It sounds fairly good to me. Yeah, good. Is it bad on the stream? Great. Uh, we're saying here that you're contributing a lot. So 
let's give it another minute and then we can highlight a little bit here also over voice Yeah, I, I could start off Bjorn, by asking you, so, so uh, what are your habits when it comes to software documentation? How are you, how are you doing it? Uh, I'm, uh, I have, have poor documentation habits, I must say. Um, I often get beaten by myself then I'm, when I come back to all repositories with, without the readme or any explanation. So it takes time to get to understand what I did two years ago. So, but uh, but uh, after starting with Cold Refinery, I've tried to write README files so we have this, a little bit of context for the code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I've, on my side, I think I've gradually improved my documentation habits over the years. And, and, and one of the things that I learned is that documentation is something that one is doing um, it, it, it can start with one person that you're documenting for yourself so that you can pick up work at a later point in time. Uh, but I mean, the main driver though for documentation has been when I identified a need to uh, document things on, so that my colleagues could access what, what Access I've been doing. Uh, what you have done, yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's look now on all the contributions in the HackMD here. We have had a lot, uh, so we, we cannot uh, highlight it all, but um, just a few points here. Okay, because you never remember what you've done after a year or two. So that, 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 that's very true. And uh, I would say that it can happen on a Monday that you <laughs> do not remember what you did <laughs> on, 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 on the Thursday or Friday, <laughs> the week before. Um, to make it usable as well as usable for others, when you aren't available. That is a very important point. Uh, reusable and published as open source. Uh, that's a great aspect. Um, when you publish something open source, then certainly code documentation is an important component of it. Uh, I would add on to that uh, the importance of having uh, example use cases also. Um, because it sometimes happens that you have you have documentation, uh, but it's perhaps not perhaps not complete with examples. So, so then you still might then have a difficulty in getting a grip of what is this tool actually used for, uh, for real, so to say. Uh, how would you describe useful documentation? Um, yeah. Important here, two aspects here. You have uh, users and you have developers. Uh, that is very good. Because um, these are different audiences. Uh, uh, we'll see uh, that you have uh, different kinds of documentation. Uh, you can divide it in four different types, really, which addresses them users and developers differently. Yeah, exactly. Um, understand the code without testing it. Um, yes, that's important and in particular relevance when the codes become a bit larger. I, I would say that if the code is, is rather small, I would say that, okay, getting your fingers really into it to, to use it and, and to poke around with it is, okay, then you really can get a hold on what's going on under the hood. But at some point it's just too much let's say you have uh, a program which is using 10 subroutines in the back end and you're working primarily with, with two functions which are more on the on the on the top layer close to the user interface then it's very beneficial if you have some compact documentation of what the underlying kernel methods are doing because you probably will not have time to look into them Um, so highlighting here from, from the last question, so how can you motivate your colleague, colleagues to contribute to documentation? Buying uh, candy. 
Ja, bei ich gerne, <lacht> ja. Uh, this is interesting. Force people to document each other's projects. It raises questions that the implementer didn't have. Yeah, that's uh, the problem is force and academia, I think. But of mm. course, if you have a very a, a group with strict requirements, it, it could be possible. Yeah. Um, tell colleague, colleagues that this is just the way that uh, the group is, is working. That's, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, if, if one is um, getting to these habits and also build up these expectations that when you're writing code, then documentation is something that uh, need to go in there in the first place. That certainly helps because then it's easier for you to set aside time to do that work because you know that it's expected from you and, and uh, you could also expect that it will be appreciated by your colleagues. Um, yes, and I think overall, um, looking on developments over time, I would say that the, the open source uh, community and, and, and uh, the movement towards hosting academic software, but also software at large on, on repositories which often are public. That is a strong drive in itself to, to uh, have documentation for all code. Right. So perhaps uh, um, we, we, we could um, we could stop here and I say looking on the clock here I see that there's time here for the next break and it's now the full hour so we'll go for break for 10 minutes and we will reconvene here at 10 past the full hour so see you in 10 minutes bye bye So welcome back. We hope you've had a refreshing break. And thanks for all the good input on HackMD on various types of documentation. We would like to highlight that one can categorize documentation in, in, in different forms. So uh, you have tutorials, which are learning oriented materials that uh, aims them to get newcomers up and running with a code. That can be newcomers, uh, which then yeah might need to have then also I mean adequate subject uh, knowledge in order to, to approach the documentation. Um, that can also be for uh, can be good to have it as self-contained as possible. How-to guides uh, are documents which show specific workflows, specific use cases. Uh, that I mean, often for a program you have two or three or four features which are the most commonly used ones and it's very good if you have dedicated documentation on how to follow these procedures. That can sometimes also be for uh, reasons such as, I mean not only for convenience and user friendliness, but can also be for, for profound reasons such as uh, safety and, uh, and formal reasons that you need to do something in a specific way to, to comply with some regulation. Explanation that uh, connects to learning and uh, could perhaps be that you then strive to explain not only the, uh, the code, but also perhaps the underlying theory or, or, or subject field. And reference is documentation which uh, is um, very important for developers of the code uh, and, and people who would like to step in to become developers of a code. So, so here you have the technical documentation uh, of, for instance, of, of the APIs of uh, different sub-blocks of a project. And uh, importantly here is then to try to modularize this so that it to enable people step in to step in to work with a code, even though they can only at least first start look on some components of it and not everything. So um, 
related issues here, where do you put the documentation? And that can be in standalone documents. It can also be within the code itself. Um, one important form is in form of comments that you inline into the code. Uh, we will now have a go in, in, in the exercise that we will start in a few minutes. We will have a go on comments that you put in a readme file. So I'll move over to that part in the lesson. So uh, here are some guiding questions. Uh, what should be included as a bare minimum in readme files? Uh, so often, this is the first thing that you see when you approach a new product. So let's say that the code is uh, distributed over, over GitHub. Then when you go to the project page, you expect to see uh, a license file, to see a requirements file, if it is a Python project. Uh, it might be a, a dedicated file, which is called install, which contains the install instructions. Um, and then you have the file with the canonical name readme. And uh, that gives a brief description of what the program is doing. If the installation instructions are compact, it is rather common that you include the installation instructions in, in, in the readme. Um, likewise, for, for examples, if you have examples that can, can be described in, in a compact manner, you could also put them in, into the readme. But for bigger products, then okay, perhaps then uh, so to have read me just to have a very brief description of the code. So uh, we have three exercises here, and uh, you will get 15 minutes to work on them. And uh, a good choice is to go get going with the exercise one, namely to write a readme file for an example Python project. So here you find the link to an example project in which there is some code. And uh, you have here the, the pointwise uh, instructions. So the idea is that you fork this project and create a readme file. And then you start to add content according to these points here. So many of you are following on stream. Uh, some of you might follow and, and work in together in groups. Uh, if you are doing that, then you, you, you can yeah, I mean, you, you can share your write and then you can you can show it to your, your colleagues and, and get their input. So uh, there are also two other exercises that you can do. Um, draft and review a readme for one of your own projects or exercise three that you do it for a project that they have used. Um, and yeah, for you, we will get now uh, give you 15 minutes to work on one of these. So we can uh, add the direct link here to the HackMD. And now it's 16 past the hour. So we will reconvene uh, at 31 after the full hour. Okay, bye for now. Bye. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, uh, hope you had a good discussion or good thinking around what's a good readme file. Uh, there are some proposals in the HackMD shared document. Uh, and the solution to the exercises also contain some good points. So take the time to read up on that. Uh, what's good with the readme file is that it's uh, rendered by GitHub. So we all, when you access the repository, you see the readme MD or readme RST rendered as a good document. So uh, now we'll move over to something to use Sphinx. So we'll go to this use Sphinx with Markdown. And uh, here 
we see that that uh, swings are used for making a static site uh, with generated uh, generated HTML files from plain text files. So you also learn some markdown uh, after we do the exercise. So uh, the first part of the exercise will do as a type along. Um, and, and then you can do exercise two and three after we're done with the first one. So uh, we will, uh, the environment has to be the cold refinery uh, conda environment for you to make this, uh, to be able to make, uh, to do this exercise. So we do conda activate cold refinery to then have the right Python and things versions. So we can check the environment, Python version, and the important tools, Sphinx build, minus version, and uh, check that we have the Sphinx RTD theme. So it looks at that we're all set for doing the exercise. Yeah, and also check this thing's quick start version. So uh, if uh, you didn't get any errors um, on the all, uh, then uh, you're set for the exercise. So we create a doc, create a Docker directory for the example documentation and step into it. And um, there we generate a basic documentation template. So m encoder doc example. Yeah. Um, have that axon, have that. Encoder doc example, CD doc example, Sphinx quick start. And then we are asked some questions as should the separate source and build directories? For this, we say no. Project no name, test project. Walter's name, release, we have a zero, use zero dot one, project language English, and then we have go, then things uh, quick start, generate a template for us. So let's see here what we have. We have the make file, we have a build directory, static directory, templates directory, and uh, conf.py and index rst. We don't bother about the make file or the make that file. Uh, we'll just update index rs.rst and conf.p and then we'll generate the static HTML files manually. Like, um, this concerns text and HTML code, but it's really like compilation of code. Yes, it's almost close to that. So um, let's have a look at the index RST nano index rst 
So make it a little bit larger. And we'll remove the indices and the tables part. And we add uh, an, an uh, pointer to a new file called feature hyphen a markdown. So we have has to be a little bit careful with the first line of the content that must be indented to the same level as the options. So uh, we'll save the index RST. And then we edit the conf.p. And um, write my st parser. Yeah, so RST we had uh, supported right from the beginning, but here you needed to add on the support for Markdown. Yes. Mm -hmm. like we could mention that uh, also other additions are possible. So, for instance, in exercise three, you'll have the chance to activate support for mathematical expressions as expressed with the LaTeX code. Source underscore suffix with the dot RST and dot MD files. I'll save to conf.p. And we'll uh, create a feature hyphen a dot md file, which we added a reference to in the index rst file. Normal feature uh, a dot md. Control X. Save to feature hyphen A dot MD. And uh, then we should be good to go to build the site. We have the index RST, the feature minus A MD, and the conf top P. So we will uh, do Sphinx, build dot, dot for the current directory and, and the static HTML files will be written to the underscore build directory. The HTML pages are in build. So now we can open them. Let's see what's in the build directory. There are some index HTML files and others files. So now we can open the open it.
So here, this is HTML code that they have generated. However, importantly, this lives here locally on, yeah, on, on Bjorn's computers. It's, this is still yes. not on the web. So this is uh, locally. On, so each one of us have now a local copy of, or uh, instance of uh, local HTML files. So now you can uh, add more content to the um, to these local files. Add a um, feature minus b dot md to the index rst and create this file and add some more content and experiment with um, markdown and. Uh, generate new uh, HTML files and have a look at how this uh, R is rendered. And then the exercise three, you can try out math expressions. So um, now it's uh, 12.15, so you get 20 minutes for this exercise to 12.05. Yes, so till five past the whole yeah. hour. Five past the whole hour, yes. Okay, see you then. Five past. Bye. Bye. Welcome back. I uh, hope you got some got some good experience with the uh, slings and markdown. So um, and uh, we see that we get the possibility to investigate how the pages are on locally on our laptop or workstation. Um, Yes, so did you have a comment, uh, Johan? Uh, yeah, so I think, yeah. Now I'm curious here on, you've seen it, how we can build it locally and uh, how, how can we proceed if you would like to, to publish this on the web? Yeah, we'll uh, do that and that's the next step. So, uh, but we will not use the, uh, the uh, example that we created but we will create, we will copy or, or for generate from a template that's online. So that's the next uh, lesson. Deploying Sync's documentation to GitHub. So we will then serve a website from my Git repository. So it will have a special address, but uh, you can uh, have it to have myproject.org as an address instead of my user GitHub IO my project. That's possible. So this uh, we will see example of GitHub actions. So the automat automatically runs code when your repository changes. And we will run things build and make the result available to the GitHub pages. So um, the typical workflow is that you host source code with the documentation. Uh, with documentation sources on a public Git repository. And then you, each time you then do git push, the, a GitHub action triggers to be rebuild the documentation. And uh, the documentation then is pushed to a separate branch called the GH pages. So we will see an exercise example of that. We will not do this as an exercise. I will do this as a demonstration. And hopefully uh, it's uh, you can be able to do the do the same thing after the lesson. So uh, 
lean back and just watch me do the demonstration of deploying Sphinx documentation to GitHub pages. So we'll uh, then go to uh, Cold Refinery. We'll, we'll generate uh, or gen create a new repository from uh, from Cold Refinery repository. So I call it uh, document. Example. Demo. 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 Of documentation online. And now, importantly, here. You have made the repository public, and uh, in order to, to be able to host uh, web pages with uh, on, on GitHub, we need to have the repository public. Uh, if you're using the free version of GitHub, if you would like to share HTML files with GitHub pages uh, in a private setting, then you need to have a, like an enterprise version of, of GitHub. So let's see here. Go to, I wanted to, I will clone this. But where is the clone button? Mm. Oh, it's, it, the page is not on. So I'll, I'll try there. Go to file. No. Create, upload files. Um, per perhaps the, the three dots slightly above. They were just no, security okay. and sites and settings. Yeah. This was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Then I suggest you, you make the, the web page wide temporarily. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and catch the link. Yeah, there, there you have it. There you have it. Code. Yeah. Clone, copied. Mm -hmm. Clone GitHub and I'll CD into the documentation example. So I'll uh, verify the uh, that I have everything that I'm able to build the pages. That looks good. And I checked the integrity of the all internal and external links. So I'll copy this command. And that looks good as well. Mm, great. And now I'll add the file that defines the action, the GitHub action. So I'll make a directory dot GitHub workflows. And uh, now no go into uh, open the file documentation.yaml and um, this yaml file is what defines the action so we see here that uh, we'll generate docs on Git push, pull request, and workflow dispatch. And this will run on a Linux Ubuntu latest version. And uh, it will install Sphinx and Sphinx RTD team. 
and the run Sphinx build um, as a command. So I'll copy this. And save it. We do a GitHub workflows documentation.yaml and commit it and push. Commit. Add documentation pages. Hit push. So now I'll uh, go to the action pages and see what kind of actions are. Yeah, the same here, you need to have a bit wider to see the settings. Yes. So the... Yeah. I think I remembered it is... under the three dots. Something went wrong here. Mm. Failure. That was a surprise. You said something, Richard? Oh, I thought you were looking for the settings, but no. In my experience, every time I try to push to this, something will always go wrong. But it's a matter of looking at the messages, and usually you figure out. Mm -hmm. so sometimes it fails on, on the first attempt to build. Yeah. Can you click on the workflow run here on maybe the top one? And let's look at the error message. Uh, can you scroll down some? You mean what? Uh, um, oh, um, oh add her in the YAML file. Hmm. Line okay. 20. Hmm. Do you have a trailing uh, line break on the end? Mm. Mm. Do you know which line is line 20? Line 20, it says. Yeah, I'll switch to Vim. It's the line of width. Whoa. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we go. So yeah. uh, this should be perhaps one line. Mm -hmm. It like looks this? like it is yeah. one. It, it, line. Yes, it should. Yeah, should, should be GitHub dot ref. Uh, and double uh, equation marks. I know there's also some sort of tool you can install to test the GitHub actions on your own computer, which might right. be faster. But I've never yeah. actually used that. I've always done the push and see the error and then keep yeah. repeating. So, so one, uh, while it's building, we, we could 
emphasize this that a good workflow is to do like we've been doing now that we first we edit and build locally the HTML files because then one can review that the contents come out as uh, intended uh, because now when we are deploying it to github then uh, okay we have this uh, slight error here in the yaml file but, but as soon as this now goes through yeah now it's now it's through mm -hmm. uh, then it will be live on github and this is now live for all the world because it is in a pub public repo do we need to enable github pages from settings yes so okay the last operation is to go to settings yeah and then uh, pages and here and it needs to say deploy from branch and the branch is g gh pages mm -hmm. and uh, with the the slash root as the directory and save yeah o on that page before you click the save button what was displayed also this with the github enterprise is that if you have a paid for version of, of github you, you you can deploy the pages within a private namespace so, so that only your co collaborators can, can view it so now we should be able to see the example for on live Yes, there it oh, is. Oh, very great. nice. Nice. So now uh, we have a recipe for getting our documentation online. Well, that's this summary. This was the documentation lesson. So, um, a few things that we, we could add uh, to, to uh, conclude the session is that one, one thing that uh, I have experienced myself um, rather often is this that you have, for instance, this Swings machinery up and running, you're editing some documentation with this web published. Then it can be that uh, you are, let's say, five persons who are editing the contents, but you might have a team of, uh, say, 20 persons who are contributing contributing material and also need to, uh, I mean, quality, uh, I mean, to, to approve of, of the material and, or, or, and review it. And uh, <clears throat> the convenient workflow is if one can encourage the colleagues to also get up and running with uh, using Sphinx and Git on, on, on the local computer as we have been doing now because then everyone can make their edits and then generate the HTML files and preview it. However, uh, naturally it can be so that there are people who uh, cannot find time to, to get up and running with this and uh, th then it can be good if one can share previews with, uh, with, with the colleagues. Uh, and there are a few things that one can do. So, so M markdown files and RST files, they do by themselves render in, in um, not, with, with the formatting when you have them open on a web page like GitHub. So uh, piecewise, these documents, these files will, will be rendered with, so that they can be previewed. Uh, however, if you would like to share a preview of the whole thing. Um, yeah, to, to, to my knowledge, at least, it, it's a little bit tricky to do this. So one thing one can do is to build files locally and then share the whole file tree to a, uh, to, to a directory where you all have access. And then, and, and then point the colleagues to that they can look on that location. 
that, that, that works, but, but it's a little bit, uh, the back backdrop is that as soon as you then make a new change, you, you need to remember to update that preview. Um, yeah, yes, because then you have a second place to update. Yes, yes. So that, that's very easy that you that you end up being out of sync between such yeah. copies. But here in the example that we used here, we have the documentation together with the source code. So yeah, that that's uh, a good thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there were uh, earlier in the HackMD, there were some questions here about uh, some blocks of the le of the lesson that, that we didn't cover. Uh, and, and that's precisely so. Th th this lesson here uh, is content for almost three hours if we would have done everything. So uh, um, we encourage everyone who, who is interested to, to go back and, and have a look on, on this other section. So for instance, there, there's uh, we have material on how one can write uh, a good uh, documentation in line in, in, in the code and also examples of what, what does to say less less good practices for writing doc documentation so we have now come toward the end of this lesson and, and then also to, towards the end of the day five of the whole workshop so yeah perhaps we could uh, mention a little bit so, so what do we have on the schedule tomorrow Richard, tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow it will be testing. So yeah. then, uh, then uh, I guess uh, one of the exercises will be that uh, you create GitHub actions to test code, and uh, the final lesson will be modular the code development. Yeah, I think yes. they're really a good summary of. The whole week so the testing is something which almost any project can use whether it's small or big and the bigger the gate the, the bigger you get the more you can use and the modular code development that's more of a sit back and watch a project evolve and i think is sort of an amazing um well an amazing demo of everything so if someone's joining and just wants to watch, definitely they can do it tomorrow, but the first two hours will have hands-on stuff also. Yeah, and you see the feedback, the standard feedback list is on here. Please take a look, let us know what you thought. I see some comments there that it was too advanced. So yeah, I mean, now we're really getting to the point where it's combining everything. So Git, GitHub, the code refinery content environment. And we saw in the HackMD that sometimes these things did go wrong. Like if someone couldn't activate the code refinery or get the software there or push to GitHub. I mean, these are sort of catastrophic problems during a 20 minute exercise. And I think that, I mean, to solve it, it's really best to bring your computer or invite one of your colleagues or someone local that can take a look at the screen and see. So we have lots of partners on our webpage and those partners can provide support for you with these in-person or online sessions and that would be that would be good but yeah just if you had trouble following today hopefully you were able to take a step back and watch and can resume and try it out when it's appropriate for you when you have the time Let's see. Mm, so many tabs open.
I mean, we sort of by design have more things than we can cover. So our lessons aren't just designed to be taught in this one course, but it's good reference material for you. And we teach a small part of it. And we really expect that most people are going to come back and review it and learn even more than we taught later. Um, this question about the individual tools that are connected to make GitHub pages work. Um, do one of you want to comment on that? Or should I? I mean, I'm not quite sure what it means, but. So basically GitHub pages or GitHub actions and pages are a service run by GitHub. So they define this YAML syntax where you can tell it to do different things. And then one of those things is push to a certain branch in your repository. And then from that branch, the GitHub pages system deploys it and makes it available online for everyone. And we'll see a little bit more about GitHub Actions tomorrow, actually. We will see another example of the YAML file and running the continuous integration, or CI, there. Um, about this with GitHub Actions this is that under the hood you are yeah so correct me if I'm wrong Richard but, but it's running a container under the surface mm -hmm. isn't it mm -hmm. yeah. it's so all the, somehow running the stuff under there it, it, this can be seen in the uh, the log files for, for the GitHub Actions and that's also a little bit the reason why also if you have rather short content to render uh, you have this overhead from initializing the whole container that, that comes first. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there's like a, a, some starting time which always will be uh, consumed by doing this. Yeah. And in relation to that, uh, when using GitHub for free, um, it is so that the running time that one has available up front to run GitHub of actions is uh, is not unlimited it is rather generous but it can happen that if one has a lot of rendering for github pages or if one have uh, automated testing within uh, continuous integration as we will see tomorrow then that will then consume from the hours that you have awarded for your github account and it can then happen that you get warning notifications from GitHub like, oh, you have consumed all of what you have available for this month. And, and then, yeah, I mean, either you simply wait yeah. or, or, or you might, might choose then simply to to, uh, to get the subscription for GitHub. Have you ever gotten these warnings? Uh, so I, I've got them on a few occasions and, and I get it within one project where we have rather extensive uh, testing as part of continuous integration. And are they private repos or public? Those are public. Hmm. Okay. So you can get warnings. I've never gotten mm. them before, but... but yeah, I mean, I guess it's a free service. So what can you expect? <laughs> Yeah, I would say that it's a rather reasonable yeah. setup that you, you can have yeah. used the resource up to a point for free. And, and then if you need to have a lot of uh, yeah. resources that you need to, to contribute a little bit with that. And, and I think that goes also for a service like MindBinder that, that is also so it's a lot of hardware which is situated somewhere and is running and hosting the containers. And uh, it's for free uh, a little bit, but if you want to use it for more heavy loads than then you, you would need to have a subscription. Yeah. And I guess we should emphasize that we're teaching in this lesson, we go over several specific tools, Jupyter, Sphinx, GitHub actions and pages and so on. But all of these are general things. So for every component we talk about, 
there's other options which can be used. There's things other than Sphinx, like what Make Docs and many other static site generators. There's GitLab that has the equivalent CI and pages and so on. There's other types of notebooks. So our goal is to introduce the concept of what we're doing. But yeah. um, you know what you actually use in practice will vary. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And then importantly, it's also, I mean, well, uh, that this can also be, I mean, what you're using as a team, because uh, these mm. tools take, I mean, it, they, yeah. it's an investment in time to get up and running with them. And, and uh, it can then be uh, convenient yeah. if one is working with the same set of tools uh, among colleagues. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, most projects are too small to go pulling in many of these things. Like there's some certain minimum size and amount of documentation you would want before you get to Sphinx or some tool like that. But um, the important part is more that, um, well, but when you get to these big projects, there'll be likely many people there. Like you're more, more likely to join some project which is using some tool and then you'll learn that tool and probably start reusing it yourself rather than, you know, creating something completely new from scratch. Okay. So now it's now five past, uh, half past the full hour. Yeah. So are there some, yes. So Bjorn, do you have some, some things that you would like to add? Uh, I see that we could be clear on the motivation for Sphinx and also for motivation for Jupyter Lab when we use the different tools. Mm. Um, I, I think Sphinx is something you grow into when you see that your mm. readme files is getting out of hand or is getting too long to to get a grip on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, either your project were increases uh, in the, in in volume, or you get more persons involved. Then I think Sphinx is uh, the right tool for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, should we? call it a day and see you tomorrow. So any special preparation for tomorrow would be make sure that well, basically any problems you had today, ask someone and see if you can get them resolved because we do more of the GitHub and GitHub Actions and Conda environment tomorrow. Okay. for today yeah. and uh, see you tomorrow yes see you tomorrow okay see you bye